Please be seated and turn in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1. If you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, you can find Mark in the beginning of the New Testament. The first four books of the New Testament are the, the Gospels or the accounts um, of Jesus' life by four different men. And Mark is the second one, and when we uh, look at those, we see the large numbers. They are referred to as chapters, and the small numbers are verses. Those help us uh, to navigate uh, the Scriptures and uh, understand where we are uh, looking and studying together. We uh, have been be going through the, the book of Mark, and we are still in the first chapter, and we're finishing up the first chapter today, and we've already been introduced on a very quick, rapid-fire succession to the identity of Jesus, the person of Jesus, and he is presented by Mark as the Messiah sent by God, kind of on an invading collision course with the world and the world's kingdom. And he, he's come on the scene, and he's kind of immediately portrayed as someone who causes quite a stir. He is uh, someone who is very different from all the other people and all the other religious leaders. The people are amazed when, when he teaches from the scriptures, he speaks as one, not like the religious leaders, but someone who has authority. And then that amazement was amplified and built up and ramped up because Jesus didn't just speak like someone with authority, he acted like it. And when he spoke, the demons obeyed his voice. And, and not only the demons, but even sickness. And Jesus was able to, by his voice and by his touch, heal sickness. And people were amazed, and the crowds were growing, and the word of Jesus was spreading in the area. And here we find the, uh, the close of his ministry there near Capernaum. And Jesus is in the area of Galilee, and we find another amazing demonstration of both the power and the compassion of Jesus, the Messiah, who God sent to come into the world. Let's read together, beginning in verse 40, all the way through the end of chapter 1. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest. Then offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. As we consider this story together, I want to encourage you to... Uh, look at the story from maybe a different perspective. Uh, all, all too often, stories like this are familiar to us, and the things that are familiar lose the awe, lose the wonder. And so if this story is some one, a story that maybe you've even heard from, from your childhood, maybe, you're, maybe you are a child here today and you've heard this story before, maybe you heard it recently in one of the um, children's uh, lessons uh, here at the church, let me encourage you to, to, to step back. Don't leave your mind in neutral, but think about what this story tells us and what it would have been like to be there, to be a person in the crowds observing this interaction between a leper and Jesus and what that would have done to your soul. First of all, let's uh, consider this man who is the uh, the, the main character in the story, apart from Jesus, he is described simply as a leper. That simple description is basically everything we need to know about him because it describes him absolutely clearly to anyone that Mark would have originally written this to. 
Um, so anyone in the, in the early church that would have um, received this uh, a, a gospel, this good news about Jesus, would have understood, I know exactly what kind of guy this was. I would, have, I would have been able to identify not just what kind of man he was, but what his struggles he endured and the kind of places he lived. All that is wrapped up in there because leprosy is, a, is kind of a, a catch-all term for a contagious disease that is visible on the flesh. And so this uh, leprosy, as we know it today, is a specific nervous uh, system disease, um, often referred to as Hansen's disease. But uh, in biblical terms, leprosy was kind of a catch-all. It could have been that disease, but it could have also been another contagious skin disease. And to have this kind of leprosy wasn't just like having eczema. It wasn't like having a rash. This was something that was uh, clearly uh, something that was incurable, and because it was incurable and contagious, anyone who would show signs of this and show evidence that they did have an incurable, contagious disease, they were isolated. They were sent outside. They were cut off from everything and everyone. And so if someone in your family one day noticed that they had a problem with their skin, and they went to the priest, and the priest, after a period of time following the instructions that are recorded for us in Leviticus chapter 13, would look and identify, yes, it's growing, yes, it looks, and the, specific, the instructions in Leviticus for the priest to follow are very specific, and they would help identify the difference between something that wasn't very serious and something that was. And so after a period of time, if the priest went through and followed that and did declare that this was indeed leprosy and that the person who was in your family, maybe your dad, maybe your mother, was indeed now a leper, they were ceremonially unclean, and that sentence was just as bad as the pronouncement of the disease that you now have, and you were no longer able to be a part of your family. You were no longer able to go home at night and sleep in your bed and, and see and hear your children running around to interact with your spouse, to, to go to your job in the morning. All that was gone, wiped away with a sink, simple and yet horrible declaration that you are unclean. That is what it was to have leprosy. The life that you once had was completely gone, and not only was that um, pronouncement of uncleanness and the change in status and the move from within the community to outside the community, to move as part of a family to someone who has no family, as terrible as that is, the disease itself was absolutely terrible as well. And those who had leprosy would usually have visible signs that you could even tell from a distance. Oftentimes, Fingers or toes would be missing. They'd be worn down, sometimes just constantly bleeding. There would be scabs and sores and swellings on, on the faces or the, the shoulders or the arms or the legs. or abdomen. It, could, it affected the whole person, and it got worse as it went on, and it almost always eventually ended in death. And Josephus, one of the historians around this time, described the disease of leprosy as walking death. Those who were leprous were basically walking corpses. In fact, when you look at Leviticus and, and look at what uh, those who had leprosy were commanded to do, they were to actually make sure that they looked the part. And so maybe they were leprous, but the leprosy wasn't noticeable or visible to those around them. Maybe it was covered up by their clothing. Leviticus didn't allow for people to cover up their leprosy and hide it and keep it a secret. In fact, those who were declared unclean were commanded by the law to tear their clothes so their clothes would look tattered, they would look poor and dirty. They were, they were, they were commanded to have like really messy and ugly looking hair. Basically, they were commanded to look the part, even though there might, if, if there was a slight chance that they might not look it already. So if you just got leprosy and you didn't look like a walk, walking corpse yet, the law made you fit the part right away. Everything about it was, to, was, was filled with the idea and the imagery of death. It was a horrible consequence, a terrible pronouncement to have leprosy. And they would walk around and they were commanded anytime they were close to people to alert them 
loudly by saying, unclean, unclean. And every time they said that, they would again be reminded that, again, they were unclean. They were not safe to be around other people. Not only were they unclean, but their uncleanness was a horrible contagion and a potential danger to those around them. And so this leper came to Jesus. Now remember, this is one of the reasons I encourage you to consider this story from a fresh perspective, as if you've never heard it before, because remember those rules, and remember what Jesus was doing here. Jesus had been casting out demons and healing people, and huge crowds were gathering everywhere that Jesus went. So what does that mean? It means that around Jesus were huge crowds of people. Where were lepers not supposed to be? Around huge crowds of people. And so you can imagine, if you were a person in this crowd, you could hear in the distance, unclean, unclean, and the voice keeps getting louder and louder, and you wonder, what in the world is going on? Doesn't that guy know he doesn't belong here? And instead of turning away, he keeps coming. And the crowds part because they're afraid of this man who has leprosy. And Luke tells us that this wasn't one of those guys who could hide his leprosy. You could look at him and not, potentially not even know he has it because Luke says that he was full of leprosy. That idea that communicates that you would just be able to see the guy from a distance and know, oh, he's, he is one of those walking corpses. He's, he's a hopeless case. The best thing for him is for death to rush. So this man, full of leprosy, is coming through their midst. The crowd is parting, and he has the nerve to approach Jesus. This would have violated basically all of the rules in Leviticus. It would have violated all the social norms. He was obviously not concerned about those things and he must have heard about Jesus. He heard about this man who could heal. He didn't doubt his power, but he did doubt how Jesus would treat a person like him. Notice what he says. And how he approaches it, how he approaches Jesus. He comes and he implores that idea there is begging and kneeling demonstrates humility. And that word kneeling there is uh, the same Greek word that we use for worship. It demonstrates uh, just a complete humble submission. And that's how he approaches Jesus. And then he says this, if you will, you can make me clean. If he could, why wouldn't he? Because he was a social outcast, someone scorned and rejected, someone who was viewed as dangerous someone who is viewed as hopeless. How would Jesus treat this social outcast? Would he show this man the same kind of compassionate, miraculous power that he had shown to so many other people in that area? We see the response of Jesus. Jesus moved with pity, stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. Now, the way that Mark describes this um, it, it has a lot of emotionally heavy language. Moved with pity there is a very emotional term, and then there's a very, in, um, a very intentional double emphasis on the reaching and the touching of Jesus, where one of those words by itself would have clearly communicated the idea. Mark used both of them together to reinforce the idea that Jesus was moved to compassion, moved with pity. This is the same word that describes the love of the Father for his lost son that Jesus uses in the parable of the lost sons, the prodigal sons in Luke chapter 15. This is the same kind of pity and compassion that the father, when he looks off in the distance and sees his lost son returning, he has, and he runs out to greet him. That's the kind of pity and compassion that Jesus has on this social outcast. Whereas everyone else would have doubtlessly moved away from him, Jesus moved towards the leper intentionally because of his compassion and love 
because of his motivation of pity for this man. And he says to him, I will be clean. And we've kind of gotten used to the idea that Jesus is the God, Jesus is the one who heals sicknesses. And uh, in our modern day, we, we, we're kind of used to that because we have uh, doctors that do amazing things. But this isn't like going to a doctor and having the leprosy healed. This wasn't Jesus giving him a, a, a cream or some kind of instruction to, to remove the leprosy. This was a complete transformation. Notice how it's described. And immediately, the leprosy left him and he was made clean. Now, if you've been with us through the study of Mark, you know that Mark uses that word and immediately over and over here. It's the kind of part of the, his rapid-fire succession to show um, connection of events. And here, it's so, so that immediately there was no lapse of time. There was no chance for him to go home and clean things up and for his skin to heal on its own. This was an immediate transformation of a man whose body was plagued by the ravages of a horrible disease a person who was likely missing fingers and toes, whose face was likely deformed. His nose could have been partially missing. All of that was not just cured. Everything was restored. This wasn't just a healing. It was a transformation. While there may have been other people who had the power to heal, whether it was prophets or, or, uh, or doctors, Jesus here demonstrates more than just the power to heal. He demonstrates that he has the power to create. And we understand that Jesus is God, and therefore he is doing what he is very capable of doing. Not just healing someone of disease, but of completely restoring all that was destroyed by the ravages of disease in his body. And this is something that would have been visibly noticeable to anyone standing close by in the crowd. So if you were on the front row and you heard what Jesus said and you saw what happened, you would have been absolutely floored. You would have been beyond belief. How in the world? Right a second ago, this guy was full of leprosy and now he is completely restored. His skin is normal. Everything is back the way that it was before the disease. What would be the conclusion of anyone who saw that? This man, this Jesus, must be the Messiah, the one who God promised would come, make the lame to walk again, cause the blind to see, and do what? To heal the leper. No one else was capable of that. No one else had done that other than God. The next thing we see in the story is a surprising charge, this instruction from Jesus. In verse 43, it says, Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. This charge actually comes across very sternly in the original language. It's almost, it carries with it the same uh, kind of weight that a, that a really frustrated parent would have in giving, giving a child the same instruction for the fourth or fifth time. The word literally means to snort out. And so if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. It's that when you just, just kind of, you finally kind of overcome with emotion and you just kind of blurt out it again, filled with anger. Now here, Jesus has that kind of an emotional force behind his instruction. Here, He wasn't kind of just politely saying, please don't tell anyone, let's keep this between us. He is, he's clearly being very forceful with this instruction, which is a little surprising. He says, show yourself to the priest and for your cleansing what Moses commanded. So basically, his instruction is uh, a little unexpected on one hand, but totally normal on the other. He's telling him to be quiet, which is a little unexpected. We've kind of looked at that in the past before. This is a pattern that Mark is revealing about Jesus. Jesus, over and over again, it tells people who have been healed to keep it quiet. And Mark is revealing that is one of the reasons is Jesus' focus was on his preaching ministry. 
He was, he was preaching, he was telling people the good news that the Messiah has come, that they needed to repent so they could have new life, that their, their lives could be transformed and they could have a real relationship with God. They could be saved from their sins and forgiven. That was the message that Jesus was proclaiming, and he was validating that he was who he said he was by demonstrating the power that he was. He was only the Messiah would have the power to make people who are sick whole again. Only the Messiah would be able to speak and have demons obey him. Only the Messiah could transform a broken body devastated by leprosy. And yet, when the crowds were so big that it hindered Jesus' ability to share that message, and when the miracles became more important than the message, Jesus said over and over to keep it quiet. Don't tell anyone. Does that indicate, it should communicate to us what the emphasis and the priority of Jesus' ministry was. Jesus didn't come first to do amazing things and draw big crowds. Jesus came first and foremost to tell us the truth about our greatest need and how we as broken, lost sinners can be transformed and made into new creatures in His image and have our sins forgiven and have new life with Him. And so we shouldn't be surprised later in Mark chapter 10, kind of the halfway pivotal point in the, in the account of the gospel, Jesus' words are, he has come to seek and to save those who are lost. So that first part of Jesus' instruction is a little unexpected. If we're not tracking with what Mark is revealing to us about the focus and the priority of Jesus' ministry, but the second part isn't unexpected at all. Basically, Jesus is saying, go to the priest. Basically, do what is the right thing to do. Do what the law commands, which is a little surprising because we have seen so far the law get broken multiple times. The leper disregarded the law in the way that he approached Jesus, and Jesus disregarded the law in the way that he touched the leper. And now Jesus is saying, obey the law. Go to the priest and show yourself to him like Leviticus 14 commands you. Notice what he says at the very end there. What's the reason that he gives? For a proof to them. Who is this to be a proof to? If you are familiar with the story of Christ, you know that the religious leaders were not friendly with Jesus. The priests would not recognize Jesus as the Messiah. They would not turn to him in faith. Instead, they viewed him as an enemy. They viewed him as a threat. They viewed him as someone to overcome and to defeat rather than as someone who, like the leper, approach who they should approach in humble submission. But the priest of all people, with their familiarity, their familiarity with the law, would know without a doubt that the only person capable of doing something like this would in fact be the Messiah. And so if this man obeyed the law and went and traveled the 60 miles to get back to Jerusalem to go to the priest and present himself and to go through and offer the sacrifices and wait the 10 days and be inspected again and offer two more sacrifices, then the priest would have no choice but to declare him as clean. And that had never happened. It would be the first time. It would be a revelation of the power because even the rabbis and the priests themselves said that there would be only one who would ever have the power to cure a leper. And that one was to be the Messiah. And by their own admission here, if they pronounce this man clean, they would be admitting and confessing that whoever did it must by default be, in fact, the Messiah. Now, uh, we are clued in by the next verse that the man struggled to obey. He went out, instead of being quiet, he began to talk freely about it. Now, it doesn't tell us whether or not he went to Jerusalem and presented himself to the priest. Um, so we, we don't know whether or not he did. It was a long journey. It wasn't something he could have done the very next day. Um, maybe he did, but we um, honestly just don't know. That part of the, of the story isn't essential to the message that we have uh, been given by God. But I do think it would be a little unnecessarily harsh on this leper to 
condemn him for talking. Because just like everyone else that had been healed by God, they couldn't keep their mouth shut. Imagine how hard it would have been to have been that leper, cut off from your family, cut off from your friends and your community, and now you're restored, you're made clean, you can go back and you're walking through town and people recognize you. And, wait, wait, who are you? What, what, can you imagine them asking you, what happened to you? And then, I'm not allowed to tell. Do you know how hard it would have been not to just be blurting it around to everyone you see that you know, everyone who, who was, was saddened and affected by your removal from whether it was family or community. The people that you used to worship with, now you can worship with them again. And Can you imagine not telling them what happened? And the, the effect that this had on the people and the ministry of Jesus should not be surprising to us. Because after this, I mean, when, when Jesus did the other miracles, it had a profound impact and the crowds were coming. But it seems like Mark is making a connection here that once Jesus did this, then the crowds were just off the charts. Jesus could no longer stay in the towns. There was no room for him in the towns. It, 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 everywhere that Jesus went, there was such a huge crowd of people, he had to stay outside the towns. And so we see that uh, because of this miracle, the place of ministry that Jesus had had to change. Instead of being in towns and teaching in the synagogues, he was out in desolate places, and people continued to come from everywhere because the news had spread that there was someone who could not only heal, but he could transform even a leprous person. He could make him whole again, and that was amazing news. Now, as we consider this story, as amazing as it is on the surface, as, as, as beautiful as it is to recognize the power and the compassion of Jesus displayed in this story, there is more for us to consider. Leprosy here is not just a description of a horrible disease, but it's a beautiful and powerful picture of the devastation of sin in our lives. And through Scripture, God uses the, sin of, or the, the, the disease of leprosy to teach us about the dangers of sin. Kent Hughes describes it this way. He says, The nature of leprosy with its insidious beginnings, its slow progress, its destructive power, and the ultimate fruit that it brings makes it a powerful symbol of moral depravity. If we see ourselves with spiritual eyes, we see that apart from the work of Christ, we would be decaying forms of walking death. Another commentator, Zuck and Wolverd, says, says it this way, when you read about the test for leprosy described in Leviticus 13, you can see how the disease is a picture of sin. Like sin, leprosy is deeper than the skin. It spreads, it defiles, and it isolates. It renders things fit only for the fire. Anyone who has never trusted the Savior is spiritually in worse shape than a leper is physically. The powerful and gruesome imagery of leprosy can help us think correctly about our own sinful condition. I would, I would hope that all of us here at SCBC with our ministry and our focus on teaching God's word clearly and plainly would be able to, with confidence, answer this question correctly. But here's, here's the statement. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Everyone sins a little, but most people are good by nature. Well, a recent survey of American evangelicals, that's people in our country who identify themselves as Christians, and that would not include those who identify themselves as Catholic, reveals that 46% of those people, 46% of people in this country who go to our evangelical churches think that that statement is true. They agree with it. They think that people are sinful. They, they, they sin a little bit, but mostly we are good by nature. A 
consider what God's Word says about our nature. The prophet Isaiah described the condition of people this way. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 14, 23 answers a question that's often posed when we talk about the sinful condition of man, that people don't People aren't considered sinners because they sin. People sin because we are sinful by nature. And the opposition or the, the pushback to that is often, well, like, uh, but there's a lot of people who aren't Christians who don't know anything about God that do a lot of good things. What about them? It, your idea doesn't match reality. Well, in fact, it does we, if we understand things biblically. Romans 14, 23, Paul explains, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. What he's describing here is that because of our human condition as sinners, everything that we do is corrupted by sin, even if it appears to be virtuous or noble on the surface. Even the best deeds of a sinful person, then, according to God's standards, are corrupted and not acceptable. Romans 8, verse 7 to 8, Paul explains further. He says, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. We, we like to think that we can, we can approach God in our own terms. No, it's the, the, we are by default hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, why do so many people have a hard time grasping this if they say that they are Christians? They say that they believe God's message and who Jesus is. Well, first of all, it's a little uncomfortable to be confronted with that reality, isn't it? We like to look in the mirror and consider ourselves and hide over and brush under the rug all the problems that we have and tend to focus on how good we think we are. It makes us comfortable to think that we are mostly good. Now, we don't deny the fact that we have problems, but those problems are things that if we get the right help, if we get the right opportunities and the right resources, we can overcome those problems. Problems are things we can overcome. In fact, we do it all the time. And so we like to look at our sin as one of those problems rather than the problem. And I've heard, in fact, I've, I've had in the last couple of years, I've had people mention to me, why do you, why do you guys make such a big deal about sin? It seems like you talk about sin over and over again. And, and it's, it gets a little boring. It gets a little depressing. Let me encourage you to consider this. If you are a follower of Jesus here today, someone who has placed their faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, then an, a deep and honest understanding of our true condition apart from Christ is something that is good and helpful to consider and to be reminded of over and over again. Consider this, the extent to which you understand your depravity will be the depths to which your love and confidence will flow. Think about it. That, what I'm saying is if, if you understand where you came from and what a big deal it was for Jesus to come and do anything for you, then your love and appreciation and confidence in Christ and his work on your behalf to transform you is going to be so much deeper than if you think Jesus is the, the son of God who came down here to come alongside you and help you with your problems. That is not what the Messiah came to do. The Messiah came not to help us overcome our problems, but to, to show people that the problem isn't anything outside of us, the problem is inside of us. And one of the most amazing uh, pictures of this is what Jesus did in this story. Jesus has the power to go to someone who is completely and totally corrupt and hopeless and destined for death and to transform them and give them a totally new and restored life. And that's what Jesus can do to people who submit to him and trust in him and him alone, not as, not as a helper. And so think about it. If we think about our problems kind of like we think about maybe our weight, we struggle with our weight. 
Well, that's definitely a problem you can overcome. And it's really easy to overcome that if you get a gym membership, maybe get a personal trainer, and they help you overcome the problem. And you're like, man, look, we, look what we did together. That is not what salvation is. When Jesus Christ deals with a sinner and transforms them and gives them new life, there is nothing that the sinner that has been given new life can, can say, look what I did. Look at how I helped fix this problem. It is all Christ, and that is the point. When we understand that is what Jesus did, he came to us and we were all equally, completely corrupted in our sinful nature. Here's a problem. In this story, we see one man had leprosy, and no one could, could, no one could deny it. It was obvious. It was apparent. But when it comes to our lives, we're, we're pretty good at hiding our true nature, aren't we? We're not just good at deceiving ourselves. We're good at deceiving each other. And we like to put makeup on and to cover up and present ourselves as something that we know we are not. When we understand the true nature of man according to God's word, it cuts through all of that. And it doesn't matter how good of an actor you are or how obvious of a sinner you are. We're all equally in the need of the same saving help. Jesus didn't just come to rescue those who, who looked nice, who were pretty good to begin with from our human perspective. Jesus came to rescue people who knew they needed help. Just like that leper knew he had leprosy and knew that Jesus had the power to heal him, sinners experience forgiveness. Sinners receive new life when they look to Jesus as the only solution to their human condition. As we consider this amazing truth about what Jesus does for us that we could never do for ourselves, I want to point out two simple truths as we close. First of all, Jesus the Messiah has the power to do what the law cannot accomplish. There is an emphasis on the law in the way that Mark tells the story about the obvious and clear violations of the law, and then Jesus' reference even to Moses himself. The law is good at identifying sin. The law was good at and very capable of identifying leprosy. It condemns people as sinners, and it even meets out punishment sometimes. However, the law is completely incapable of forgiving. Just like a priest was completely incapable of changing the condition of a leprous person, so the law is completely incapable of changing the condition of a sinner. We cannot look to the law as our hope. Arnold Bruchtenbaum describes the significance of the law in connection with the healing of this leper. He says, although the priesthood had all these detailed instructions as to how they were to respond in the case of the healed leper, they never had the opportunity to put those instructions into effect because from the time of the Mosaic law, no Jew had ever been healed of leprosy. And as a result, it was taught by the rabbis that only the Messiah would be able to heal a Jewish leper. So when we consider the law and what Jesus did, All the law can do is say unclean and guilty, but Jesus reveals the power to make the unclean clean. He has the power to make the guilty innocent. Consider the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the, sp is of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For, by God, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Jesus reveals to us that the most popular conception of God's expectations is totally flawed. The most popular idea in the world today is that God is pleased when people are good, when people keep the law. That is a horrible idea because the law here is completely incapable of restoring people with God. But Jesus is very capable of doing what the law cannot do. And so we are to look at Jesus the Messiah, not as something like the law, but something so much better. Jesus the Messiah also has a compassion to do what we do not deserve. 
Jesus was compassionate in dealing with the outcast leper and healing him, and not just healing him, but touching him. In this story, there are two reversals that help us understand the compassion of Jesus. First reversal shows us the compassion towards a leper. The second one is a picture of the compassion that he has towards you. First of all, based on the law, anyone who touches a leper would themselves be declared unclean. But yet, the exact opposite happens when Jesus touches a leper. Again, that's one of those things that if you were familiar with leprosy and you were observing that immediately, you would have been like, when Jesus reached out his hand, you would have been like, no, don't do it. We know what's going to happen. But then the exact opposite thing happened, and it's amazing. Jesus demonstrated his compassion and his power by that amazing reversal. What, what we thought and what should normally happen didn't happen. Instead, the opposite happened. The one who was unclean became clean. Now consider the next reversal. There was a reversal of position. In verse 39, we read that Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, casting out demons. So before Jesus met this leper, the leper was living in isolation. The leper was in the wilderness. The leper was outside the village. Jesus was inside the villages, teaching in the synagogues, being around crowds. After Jesus healed the leper, where was Jesus forced to go? Jesus was forced to go outside into the desolate places. The imagery and the way that Mark describes the, these, word, these uh, places is very parallel. Mark is, Mark is doing something with the way that he's describing it. He's pointing out that Jesus and the leper here have traded places. After the leper was healed, the leper went to where Jesus had been. He was in the villages. He was close to people. He was in that community. This reversal shows us the compassion of Jesus because ultimately Jesus was willing to trade places with us. Jesus came to this earth living the life that he didn't have to live, experiencing suffering that he didn't need or deserve. But we deserve those things. Jesus' home was in heaven. Our home was in this world. Jesus was perfect and holy. We were not. We were sinful completely. Jesus was joining an eternal right relationship with God the Father, and we were living in rebellion against God, destined for eternal punishment. So here is the reversal. Jesus left the glories of heaven and came and invaded this world. He took on the form of a man and lived under the law. Jesus switched places with us. We are guilty before God. We deserve to be punished for our rebellion. We deserve that eternal separation from God, but Jesus took our place on the cross. He bore the weight of our sin. He suffered the pain that we deserve to suffer. He died the death that we are destined for. And because Jesus took our place, we are invited to take his. We can be forgiven and welcomed into Jesus' home. We can be a part of God's family. His destiny can be our destiny. Eternal joy, living with God forever in perfect relationship. We do well to remember that we are like the leper. We are completely and absolutely corrupted through sin. Our condition is corrupt and helpless, hopeless and cut off. We are indeed outcast of heaven. We aren't any better than a walking corpse. Like the leper, when we humbly come to Christ, we will find the power and the compassion to be made alive, to be restored, to be made righteous, to have hope, to be welcomed into the family of God. So if you're here this morning and you are still dead in your sins, won't you come to Jesus? Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for the power of Jesus to bring life where there was once only death. God, I thank you that as your children, we can witness that power revealed every time a sinner turns to you in repentance and confesses that you are Lord. God, may we have a better understanding of our human condition as sinful people 
through the image of leprosy. And may that drive and stir within us a deep devotion to Christ as we understand the condition in which we were found, the love in which we received, and we can walk with confidence knowing that if you loved us while we were like that, then you can still love us now and you will. So may we walk with confidence as your children, living according to your plans and your purposes. And God, may any who are lost here this morning approach Christ in the manner of the leper and receive new life. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.